What is up, sports bettors? Welcome to the Guys and Bets podcast. It is uh, Wednesday, the 22nd day of May. Odd Shark HQ closed on Monday, so you didn't get to record the pod then. But we are back here midweek. Talk about the same sort of stuff. Uh, it's all timely. Um, Andrew Avery here with Chris Abbott. hey First and foremost, Chris. Yeah. Good weekend win with Brooks Kepka. In uh, the PGA Championship. I know you got him at what, 10 to 1? 10 to 1, Brooks Kepka actually saved my weekend. Uh, I, I've actually had a uh, not a great run of single game bets. Dude, May has. So the last couple of weeks of March and April were probably, it's probably the best sports betting run I've had. Yeah. May has been a complete and utter failure for yeah. me. So like that Kepka bet hit, and then I had an, a, like a three game parlay that hit. And I had uh, another like um, like hockey win and over a couple of combined there, and those have been saving me to be honest. Like I've I've cooled off a little bit, even with MLB. I'm kind of like splitting the board, um, which is fun, way better than losing them all. But I've had a couple of a uh, couple of days where I've I've definitely my bankroll's taken a hit. But you, the, you roll with the punches, especially during baseball season. There's so many games, yeah. so you know you're going to have bad beats in there. Like I've said before, you just stick to the strategy and and trust trust your knowledge and, and research. And at the end of the day, it should work out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're going to get bad beats. Everyone goes through bad beats. But everything comes around. Everything balances itself out. You get miraculous wins. Yeah, You got to exactly. take the good with the bad. But yeah, May, May for me has been a joke. The good part is it's almost over already. It's almost over. And June 1st starts with... The biggest sporting event of the year, Tottenham, Liverpool, Champions League final. It doesn't start until then? Yeah, I know. It's kind of silly. Wow. Um, I say this, of course, those of you that know me out there, diehard Tottenham fan. This, of course, is a surreal, surreal time being a Tottenham fan. Champions League final, who would have thunk it? That that phrase always kind of makes me diehard fan. What does that mean? Diehard? Like, was that around, that was around before the movie Die Hard. Does that mean like you would just go to the go to your death and not turn your back on the team? Is that what die hard means? I don't know what it literally means, but that ticks boxes for the way I feel about Tottenham. There there's no team out there I root for harder than Tottenham. Uh I'm a Niners fan. I've been a Niners fan for as long as I can remember. I grew up, of course, in the Halcyon days of Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, Ronnie Lott. Roger Craig. So when I started following the NFL, they were my team. Sort of a bandwagon, but I was a kid, whatever. But stuck with them through thick and thin. Google tells me the definition of diehard is someone or something that shows or possesses extreme, absolute, or complete loyalty, even if facing defeat or hopelessness. An example of a diehard fan is a person who goes to see a losing team play every single game, even in the rain, or if the game is an exhibition game. So uh, That checks out. Yeah, it means you won't go away. Yeah, and I mean... I'm Labrador a, retrievers are diehard dogs. I'm an Ottawa Senators fan. Yeah. Now, granted, I haven't watched a lot of their games in the 2018-19 season for obvious reasons, but uh, it's not like I would ever jump ship and, and find another NHL team to root for. I'm not that guy. I've got my teams. I stick with them through thick and thin. And, I mean... With sports, you go through lean periods and you go through amazing periods as well. You know what fascinates me about Google? Hmm. Is that you learn about people. Yeah. As in, under my what's the definition of a diehard fan, Yeah. people also ask, what is a diehard fan? H-E-A-R-T. <laughs> as in, get your ears checked. Yeah. There's no such thing as exactly. a diehard fan. We can, we can try and make that common vernacular. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Disagree. Disagree. To me, die heart fan would be like it, you actually have a heart attack. Well, you would then be a die heart fan. Yeah, that's a good definition there. And the way sports goes, you can't rule that out. I know you're a die heart or were a die heart fan for Game of Thrones. And I want to start. Definitely die heart. Fan. <laughs> it's already happening. I want to start there um, with Game of Thrones. So the, the season finale aired on a Sunday. Series is over. 
um, the end of a real television phenomenon. Most people have watched it. I have not seen an episode of this final season. If you haven't and you want to avoid spoilers, uh, you might want to scrub through um, and uh, find the next segment when we talk about the NBA. But Chris, as somebody who watched the show every Sunday, as somebody who covered the betting aspect of that final season for oddshark.com. What is your opinion on the season? There seems to be a big divide between the audience. I was up late watching that Raps Bucks double OT game on Sunday, and uh, I was too far gone. I, I, I'm privy to the spoilers that have gone on in the season, so I didn't care. I said, screw it. I'll see what's going on on Twitter. A lot of negative feedback, but some positive feedback as well with the show now wrapped up. But What's your two cents? Vote two-part question okay. on the season as a whole and the finale. Okay. So season as a whole, from a purely epic or cinematography perspective, um, I think was A1, A+. A plus. But there were like some huge errors in, not errors, I suppose, but I found the writing to be lacking. I also found the editing to be lacking. Of course, we had the Starbucks cup situation. Correct. Then and we there also, was another one we, on Sunday. A plastic bottle on, on arguably the biggest um, scene in the, the most, show. The most pivotal ever. scene in the show. Mm -hmm. And who was it that had a, the water bottle? Samwell Tarly. Samwell yeah. had a plastic water bottle. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm no engineer, but I doubt plastics were invented. It sure, At didn't, this point. sure didn't look like it. But then again, we're not really sure what point in time this takes place. I mean, True. it is an alternate universe, but I did not see much in the way of plastic throughout. <laughs> yeah. And I would think that these people were smart enough to use plastic should it be available to them. Right. So obviously huge, another error in editing. And that, to me, when you combine all that for, you know, the entire season, there were some editing errors. There was uh, a, a lack in, in the writing, I thought, um, just lack of creativity. And I think they rushed it. I mean, they had they did six episodes, and it looked like it was in a hurry to get out the door. And that's when those errors occur. I mean, I love the show. I, it was a great series, phenomenal series, really. It redefined how we watch TV in a lot of ways. But eh, that's that's my my season view, and I also give it eh to the series finale episode I, I thought yeah I just thought they they rushed the conclusion of the story I, I would have been fine if it ended after season three and the Night King died it, at least then in my mind I could have these characters go off and do something mm. but when it was presented to me and not even that it wasn't plausible it just wasn't I thought a fair way to end for a lot of the characters. Sure, you know, and I think the the show set itself to such a high standard that that's why some people are disappointed. Yeah, not because you know they, they, it was obviously beautiful and and the score was really good and all that, but I just think they and with a lot of these shows maybe you get to a point where you can't salvage it. Right. I don't know. Um, we 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 talked a little bit about this off camera and off air. Uh, yesterday but with the source material behind now from the pace of the show and I think the past couple seasons yeah for sure yeah is this not just tantamount to fan fiction at this point the writing staff at HBO for, or for Game of Thrones who undoubtedly talented group mm -hmm. but is this not just fan fiction it's them taking the canon that exists within this world, within this series of books written by George R.R. R. Martin, but are they not taking it and finishing it off on their own terms, or creating new stories, new arcs, which is basically fan fiction? It was fun, you know, yes. And I thought that the way that the timing of the series had gone until that point is what led it to its epicness and... Again, just just rushed, just mm. rushed. Like, for example, we had okay, fine. Jon Snow kills Daenerys in a tragic ending, love story, um, to a degree, and his character almost kind of flips a switch. And then, up until that point, we had seen all all of her armies. I don't know anyone who opposes the queen killed immediately, no questions asked. 
and the person who kills the queen, uh, he gets tossed in jail, we fade to black, and we come back out a month later. It, it didn't make sense to me. And I, I just thought it, it lacked. I didn't care that the, st- the storyline went from the books into something new because, mm. you know, that obviously that's what they had to do because George R. R. Martin is just, I don't know what he does all day. But Chills. Not Walks really, around town saying, I'm George Martin. Not really concerned with finalizing the story that people love. And frankly, okay, he doesn't owe anyone anything, but yeah, he owes people who have obviously put a ton of money in his pocket right now. Sure. I think he owes that to to the fans to finish it. Yeah, he doesn't seem to give a shit, though. Right. Um, I, I mentioned this off the top as we were getting into the Game of Thrones uh, recap here, but one of your responsibilities, one of the many responsibilities you have here at Odd Shark... That's is, right. Hardest working candy <laughs> in show business. Is that you were covering the betting angles of this series, of which there were plenty, and which over the last couple seasons, has gotten pretty popular. A lot of folks jumping on board and betting Game of Thrones. So yeah. what bets were out there that that cashed anything of notable value um, that were in the market there for, for Game of Thrones betters? What were some of the notable hits? For sure. So I want to preface this by saying entertainment betting is a whole new world. Totally. And it's really a fantastic place for odds makers and books to gain new customers. And it's a great way to make money if you're smart because uh, we saw a lot of these prop bets cash and for, for pretty good money. Now, obviously, they set a limit on these, but it's still pretty good. Like, let's see. So some some easy ones that were like, um, you know, minus 110 on each side of the coin, like will Daenerys survive the final season? Yes or no? No. You could have made minus 115. Jon Snow, same situation. Yes, minus 115. Uh, will Tyrion survive the final season? Yes, plus 110, so there's money to be made there. Which Greyjoy will perish first? Theon was plus 130. There's a lot of value there. And then there's there's some more, like will Tyrion be proven to have made a plot with Cersei? So that sounds like somebody knew something. And so yes was like minus 200, but no was plus 150. Well, there was no secret plot, so no plus 150 paid. Then... They knew there was going to be a final battle between the Cleganes, Sandor and Gregor, the Hound and the Mountain. And it asked, you know, who would win, what would happen. And there was an option for both to be destroyed in the final battle, which is exactly what happened at the same time. And that paid plus 350. Mm. So that's serious. Great value. And then after episode two, well, before I get that, before the season, will the Night King, Night King be confirmed as a Stark? So... There is a prevailing theory out there that Bran and the Night King were one and the same. Mm. Uh, and no to that question, again, plus 350. Three and a half to one. So obviously it was not confirmed that he was a Stark. Boom, cash again. Yeah. Then Bran, who was the betting favorite heading into the season, after episode two, where Bran kind of in the first couple episodes was not really a factor, and the Night King was coming to kill him and all that. And it's like, oh, maybe the Night King is going to get get to Bran and kill him. And he was plus 450 after episode two. And he ends up uh, ruling Westeros at the end of the show. Right. So, yeah, was, yeah there's some lots of bets that cash there. Amazing betting opportunities. And congratulations to those of you that are listening that jumped in uh, to bet some of these and hit some of those uh, great value bets. And now, of course, the show is over. The end of an era. I did see some spinoff props come out just this morning. Really? Yeah. So the great transition to my next question, which is going to be with the advent of your your Netflixes and your Amazon Primes and your Hulus, et cetera, et cetera, all the streaming services out there, Mm -hmm. the sort of weekly prestige drama television is is sort of dying and, and Game of Thrones now finished. It was sort of the last one that we have. Now, I trust HBO will come out with another huge budget show that water cooler shows they're referred to as where people watch them on a Sunday, which is generally HBO's biggest night. And then people get to work, talk about them, wait for a week. But now people just binge watch stuff, whether it's Mm -hmm. on whatever streaming service it is. But do you think that we see another show like this, a water cooler show, for lack of a better term, and is a sort of spinoff series a reality here for Game of Thrones? Well, I definitely think there will be a spinoff series, if not more. 
Um, one of the props was, will there be a spinoff about Arya's new adventures? Because at the end of the show, she says she's going to explore whatever is west of Westeros, and she takes a couple of ships, and Christopher Columbus is her way out of town. Nice. So, yeah, I, I think so. I think she's a popular character, and they really, really did not finish her storyline. So that could have been on purpose. Okay. And that's what some people are thinking, that they left some things out of the end of this show t so they could talk about it in another. Maybe they will. But there are, HBO even has shows that I think are, could be that. Like, I think Westworld is a phenomenal show. It is. It absolutely is. But it, it's interesting that Game of Thrones, I think, caught so much fire. that mm -hmm. every, Like, it was, a, it was a mainstay of culture. And uh, Westworld is not that, yeah. even though it's popular. So I'm curious to wonder w why that happened. Like, why, why did Game of Thrones become so big? I think two parts. And so the first is that I've never read the books. No, but I think I. because the books were so good and so well written um, with intricate plot lines and characters and a world that was crafted that was just different. So I think that and the way HBO transitioned that onto the screen was seamless especially when they were dealing with the george martin source material and so because i i would assume that his writing was so effective on the book on the books and that was transitioned to scripts and dialogue and on screen that they just made everything work mm -hmm. and because the books were so good and because the transition to tv was so good that it became it caught like fire mm -hmm. Second part to that is it sort of changed TV where in a way that nobody's safe. Season yeah. one, yeah. Ned Stark dies. Nobody saw that coming. Mm -hmm. Then people start talking about it and they say, oh, you got to watch this show, Game of Thrones. Like It's not like everything else. It's not yeah. like everything else. And then we have the Red Wedding episode. Mm -hmm. And it's just a kick in the balls to watch these shows, but you can't stop watching because who's going to go next what's going to happen but to lead to the original point now that we were off george mm -hmm. martin's source material shit goes south it did and you didn't get those uh oh there goes a there goes a, a main character right like i thought for sure in season eight your show is ending start killing off some of the main characters early surprise us that didn't happen that yeah. really didn't happen like the only theon Greyjoy died for, okay, so I know you didn't see it, but the Battle of Winterfell, when when the army of the dead comes to Winterfell, is like over an hour of death. Yeah. Yet none of the main characters die. Like right. a couple of fringe. Right. A couple of fringe guys die. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have liked to see, like, I would have liked to see somebody go down in, in episode one because that would have had me more engaged. Like, right. okay, but. Instead, they did the traditional TV thing where exactly. the protagonist is in trouble but gets out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when we were dealing with the source material, that didn't happen. Right. Nobody was safe. Yeah. Take the leap. Yeah. Don't Take be, the don't leap. Don't be chicken. Kill your main characters. <laughs> That's but right. But back to what you said. So I, I can kind of equate that to the Monday Night Wars in wrestling in the late 90s. Yeah. Where you had to tune in every week because you didn't know what was going to happen. Right. You didn't know which character was going to leave the show or show up on the other show. And yeah. and you had to watch kind of the same vein in that you didn't know who's going to die or like, you know what I mean? What, yeah. what are they going to do this week? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess it's hard to push the envelope, but HBO is the one that can do it or Showtime because they, they have the, that um, freedom. Yeah, right. it's true. Uh, so I, where the water cooler prestige series are few and far between nowadays i fully trust hbo to get us back and one show which is not a, a water cooler show per se and not one that will have betting markets for but uh you gotta watch um chernobyl on hbo it's fantastic i've been meaning to man i i got it. the the initial promos for that got me like whoa yeah because this is a little shows a bit of my masochistic side maybe why i'm such a sports better yeah i like seeing bad shit happened. Me too. I, that's what I look for. <laughs> and that's, there's a reality that's based in reality, yeah. right? So you kind of like seeing the really, wow, that would suck. Yeah. Yeah. I love watching that kind of stuff. Now, interestingly, personally, I, when I, I know we're way off sports, but I think guys like to talk about other shit too. So 
when I was growing up, when I first went to university, I was going to be a history major and a history teacher. You and me both. I Really? Yeah. I loved World War II yeah. in, in terms of just, I guess it was the best documented, huge scale, just w w disaster. Yeah. Right? And for lack of a better term. And I think that's what Chernobyl's doing. And now, for the first time in my life, so you learn all about communism and all that stuff. For the first time in my life in a couple of weeks, I'm not going to be around here for a bit. I'm going to the Czech Republic. Yeah. And I'm going to get to see some of, you know, kind of what was behind the Iron Curtain yep. back in the day. And I'm, I'm excited about that, but I'm nervous because, I, oh, I like watching this stuff on TV. Now, I know they're, they're a democracy now and all that, but just to see some of the things that happened. Absolutely. And, and where they happened. Yeah, you know? and a lot of those places will still have been maintained, yeah. if I'm to guess. And my, my parents have been to Prague. Uh, everybody that I know that has been to Prague just raves about it and has nothing but incredible things. I think it was one of the places it. that just wasn't touched by the war, so a lot of the infrastructure still... But I can take like a, a quick trip over... Well, you've spent a lot of time in Europe. Yeah. So I can take a quick trip to Poland and or a quick trip to Austria and so... Really, really interesting stuff, or Germany, really, and especially, you know, the heartbeat of World War II, yeah, obviously, right? So, exactly. Yeah. And speaking of World War II, one of the, uh, one of the slackest participants was <laughs> Italy, and uh, we sort of thought that the Toronto Raptors were going to be the Italy of the NBA playoffs, down 0-2 to the Milwaukee Bucks, but as we sit here recording this on Wednesday afternoon, they came out and played their best game of the playoffs last night to beat the Bucks by, I don't know, 18 or something. Yeah. Easily cover that spread. Both sides of the ball, just a fantastic game all around. Great game plan by Nick Nurse. The bench scored. Everything fell into place for the Raptors. So new life in that series. And looking at uh, NBA championship futures odds here, the Golden State Warriors, who polished off the Portland Trailblazers the other night to sweep them. Despite an absolutely insane performance from Myers Leonard and Damian Lillard got his game going a little bit there in game four as well. Warriors minus 220, Bucks plus 260, Raptors 9 to 1 as we sit here on Wednesday afternoon in NBA series markets. No such thing as a sure thing, Chris. Sure thing, I'll, I'll air quote. But is the Warriors winning the title a sure thing? Well, yeah, I, guess, I, I would think so. But they're an injury away to being in a lot of trouble, too. Because if Kevin Durant doesn't come back and Andre Godala missed the last game, if Steph Curry or Klay Thompson or Draymond Green gets hurt, mm. then you're, you're seriously challenging your depth against either Toronto or Milwaukee, who are basically fully healthy at this point. Yeah. So I think there's something to be said for that. And I think there's something to be said for Milwaukee and Toronto each raising each other's game right now. And I think should the Raptors find a way to get past the Bucks, they may present a bigger challenge to the Warriors just because they're proving to be a very difficult team to play against on the defensive side of the floor. Yeah. They're making Giannis's life miserable right now. And I didn't think anybody was going to stop him from getting his 28 or 30 points. It would be the rest of the guys. But they've gone right to him, and uh, it's it's making a difference. And you got guys like Pascal Siakam stepping up. I mean, he's earning himself a serious, serious amount of money oh, yeah. this season and in these playoffs. Now everybody's seen him. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I love to hate Kyle Lowry, but... He stepped up last night. He's, he has been, you know, especially in this series. So... Uh, the Raptors would say plus nine hundred, and they're two to one to come back to not even come come back and win this series. Teams are even; it's best of three. Yeah, I was all about the Bucks, but now the Raptors have me wondering. Really, they really do. Uh, a, a great performance in Game Four, but Game Five. Uh, books have the Bucks as seven point home. I uh, already bet the Raptors. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, seven is a, a lot. lot. For this series, it's yeah, a ton. It is. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that as an underdog for sure. I mean, if I if you look at it, the only game that Milwaukee kind of dominated was game two. Yeah. They came back and won game one. That's To me, that's more on the Raptors for not finishing it. Yeah. And Toronto wins game three and four. Yeah, and game so. four without... 
I mean, we mentioned everyone that stepped up, but Kawhi, not his best game. Mm -hmm. Points-wise, he still played well, obviously. The guy never has a, a bad game, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, I think Nick Nurse is earning some money, too. Totally. He's yeah. been great. Yeah. I thought there was a huge coaching advantage for Budenholzer and the Bucks in this one, but Nurse is, is showing some muscle here, and it's been really, really impressive. NBA playoffs can be largely uninteresting, boring a lot of the way. We saw it in the West with the Warriors sweeping, despite some close games, some exciting games, it should be said. But this uh, Eastern Conference final has been dynamite um, all across the board. Some great individual performances, some team performances, some great coaching. Yeah, magical stuff. Um, and you, you were referring to injuries. <clears throat> and now we have the Warriors sweeping in the Western final without Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. Do they even need Kevin Durant to win this thing? They're a different team without Kevin Durant. I think they're very dangerous in terms of the fact that they've got to spread it around a little bit more. I think, I could be wrong, but I think they're playing with a little more pace without him. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, a little more high energy, and I think that's more of Steph Curry's game rather than going down and uh, you know giving the ball up to Durant for whatever he takes, you know, his 25 or 30 yeah. shots a game. Obviously, he's a fantastic basketball player, but... It gives the Warriors it, – it, they're a different team. They're, they're, I don't know if they're better, but they're a different team without him and maybe more dangerous. Yeah, it's interesting to and watch. And harder to defend. Harder to defend. Um, Steph Curry obviously stepping up in a major way without KD, but it's just the old Warriors. It's mm -hmm. Clay. it's Steph, it's Draymond Green. It's, it's the guys that have already won titles. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Without Kevin Durant in the lineup, the offense is a different look. It's higher tempo. It's fearless shooting from Clay and Steph, whereas Durant gets the ball and maybe he mix it, mixes in some iso ball mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. It, it's going to be interesting. Um, the latest I saw was, was that this injury to KD is potentially a bit more serious than they anticipated. I'd love to see a good finals, like six, seven games, competitive basketball. And if the Warriors win, fair enough. But give me a team out of this East, whether it's the Raps or the Bucks, that can push this team, that can that, that can hit them in the jaw with a punch in a couple games. And I think you're more likely to get that from those East teams than what was coming out of the West anyway. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, the Rockets pushed them to the max, and frankly, the Rockets blew it. Yeah, they totally did. Right, and I wasn't really concerned with any of the other teams anyway. Yeah, I sort of like the Nuggets, but they needed a year of playoff experience under mm -hmm. the belt with this core that they have. Jokic is top two or three favorite player in the league for me. I love watching that guy play. Jamal Murray, so streaky, so hot and yeah. cold, can go for 30, then can go for 10. Um, I like what's going on there in Denver, uh, but yeah, I digress. Um, over to the NHL, um, folks, if you do not watch Guys and Bets every weekday, noon Eastern, on the Odd Shark YouTube channel, you have to. Uh, Chris Abbott, Joe Osborne, breaking down six of uh, the biggest games on each day's board and uh, capping it, giving you picks. But yesterday on the show, Chris's uh, pick for game six between the Sharks and Blues was over five and a half. I think you capped that game to perfection. You also mentioned a side play on the Blues, which you hit. So now we have the Blues and the Bruins in the Stanley Cup. Harkens back to the days of Bobby Orr's airborne goal, that famous photo. Doesn't even harken. That was the last time St. Louis was in the Stanley Cup final. Exactly. Um, so what we have here now is the Bruins as decently sized favorites here to mm -hmm. lift Lord Stanley's mug at minus 165 with uh, the Blues coming back at plus 145. So I want your pick, but here's my thing about this. The Bruins have had how many days off before Monday, the puck drops It'll on Monday? It'll be 10 one? full days off. Ten full days off, which yeah. equals the record of the longest hiatus before the Stanley Cup Game 1. Chris, that belongs to the Anaheim Ducks of 2003. The Ducks ended up losing that Stanley Cup to the New Jersey Devils. The Ducks didn't even score a goal until Game 3. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, and you can start here and then you can cap the series if you'd like and give us a, give us a pick. Okay. 
Does this rest help the Bruins or does it hinder them? And should betters be taking the underdog look seriously in this one? Okay, so to answer your first question, does the rest help them? I think it helps everyone but goaltender Tuka Rask. Okay. I, the Bruins, to me, I, I'm not sure on average because the Bruins have a bunch of young guys, but their top players are older than St. Louis is. So I think any bumps and bruises they've had along the way will now get some time to heal. Zdeno Chara missed game four against Carolina. So this time off is invaluable to him. But Rask was in such a zone and riding such momentum, playing every second night. Um, he was he was literally a brick wall in the net. You couldn't yeah. score on him. However, the teams they played, especially Carolina, not a super offensive team. They played Columbus, a decent offensive team. And they went seven games with Toronto, who is a good offensive team. Yeah. So... To me, the rest is good for the Bruins in that in that regard, but it remains to be seen. I think it's a huge question mark how Tuka Rask responds in Game One, which will be in Boston on Monday. Yeah. With that, you said the Blues plus yeah, they're everywhere. I've seen from plus one forty five, plus one forty. Um, I think I got them a plus one forty, so that's a bit of a spoiler. But the Blues are seven and two on the road in these playoffs, and they'll start on the road in Boston, as I mentioned. So, I think. That's a, a big advantage for St. Louis. And the way they played, the way they closed out both series yeah. uh, against both Dallas and um, San, San Jose, Jose. Strong. Like they outscored the Sharks 12 to 2 in the last three games of that series. And they were dominant. Like it wasn't even really close. Yeah. Um, the last two games were 5 nothing and 5 1. Yeah. St. Louis allows four fewer shots per game. And I think Boston's forward group will be in a little bit of trouble against a very deep, very experienced, very big St. Louis defensive core. And yes, the Bruins have the best line in hockey, but after that, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And I think if St. Louis pairs, the, the advantage that St. Louis has is that its first D pair or its second D pair can play against the Bruins' top line. And when you're on the road, that matters because you don't get a chance to match on the whistle all the time. Yeah, But it, you're going to play those top four guys 45 minutes of the game. So all they have to do is try and make sure to get the other group out after the big line has a shift. Yeah. So I really like how that sets up for St. Louis. And I think just the grind of the playoffs. Like I mentioned, Chara was playing hurt. If he, for some reason, is not able to go, or if he comes out in game one and he's injured, then you've got a really inexperienced, really small, good skating, but small Bruins back end. And the Blues have four lines that can play the way the Bruins like to play the game, right. which is down deep in the zone, body cycling. So with all that said, with a price of plus 140, I think St. Louis is a great play here. Now the Bruins were my pre-playoff pick. Yeah. And I got a, a good futures ticket on them back a few months ago, like February. So it's kind of a hedge for me too. But I, I do think St. Louis right now has the advantage. Right. If, if these two teams played in the first round of the playoffs, yeah. I might have a different answer for you. Sure. But I think St. Louis is healthy. And the way they're playing and their playoff style, I don't know if somebody's going to beat them four times. And Jordan Bennington has been unflappable. Yeah. On Very flappable. Good. Rask has better numbers, but Bennington's been absolutely massive, and I don't think the moment's going to get to him. Yeah, equally as good. Um, so is the biggest mismatch in this series forward depth? To, for me, yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it definitely is. The Bruins have um, a good forward group. Don't get me wrong. And they play the game really hard, and they play it the right way. What I expect to see if you're not interested in playing a series price here, is a lot of low-scoring games. Yeah. I'm seeing 2-1, two, 2-0, 3-1, two, 3-2. Uh, I, I think we'll see totals get to five yeah. instead of five and a half here. Interesting. Yeah. So if we do see fives, hammer the over? Or do you trust these goalies too much? I mean, I, it's hard It's hard to get, get to five on these guys. Yeah. So I, I, it'll be interesting, but... I would, especially the first, maybe game one. If game one was five, yeah. I might consider the over because of the layoff for the Bruins. But as you get into the series, if it, it's going to be five, five and a half. It's never going to hit six. 
But I think this is going to be a very, very, very low-scoring playoff series. Well, game one on Monday, we've got uh, very reflective of series price markets. Bruins minus 165. Blues plus 145. The total is five and a half, but mm. minus 135 on the under. Yeah. And we're still a few days away. Yeah. Maybe we do see that get to a flat five. That's what I would expect. Yeah, very interesting. I expect a very, very good Stanley Cup final uh, over there in the NHL uh, and a very good matchup. Glad the Blues are there. Not obviously my favorite team, but certainly a team that I've admired down the years. A lot. I mean, I grew up in the Hall and Oates era, Al McInnes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to get to soccer real quick here. Um, still days away from the Europa League and the Champions League. I will. Uh, I had a little bit of an early cap and pick on those on a couple podcasts ago, I think. But uh, over in England, we've got uh, the playoff from the championship, which is for the third promotion place to the Premier League. We've got Norwich uh, is in. We've got Sheffield United is in. Those two will be in the Prem next season. And so we've got a final on Monday, and it's Derby County against Aston Villa. Three-way money line markets line up like so. Derby plus 250. Draw plus 225. Villa plus 120. Um, I advised on the pod a while back when these uh, matchups were set to, with both Villa and Leeds United at plus money to take a shot on either of those. Now, Leeds obviously screwed the pooch against Derby, uh, got their asses handed to them in the second leg of that one. Um, I like Aston Villa three-way money line pick here, plus 120, to win this game through 90 minutes. Villa absolutely crushed Derby County in both games this season in the league. Uh, They beat them four zip at home and three zip on the road at Derby. This game will be neutral site. It will be at Wembley Stadium on Monday. Does that factor in to what you think? Um, Home field advantage is big in soccer. And it's Wembley. And it's Wembley. Uh, I don't expect... I don't expect 80,000, but no. it'll be a big crowd. Yeah. Um, maybe it will be a sellout. I don't know. Um, Villa is a, a pretty big club. I mean, they were a Premier League mainstay for many, many, many years. They've had a rough go the last couple of years. Um, but full complement of players to pick from here, and they just have better players, more talented players. Jack Grealish, for one, their playmaker, uh, linked to a potential move to bigger clubs like my Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, And Tammy Abraham, their forward, who scored, I think, 26 goals in the league. Uh, I think he's Chelsea property on loan. Might Might have been a full transfer. I can't remember his status there. But very, very talented players there at Villa. Uh, Scott Malone for Derby, going to miss this game. Through suspension, I think this is a good betting spot here for Villa. Villa was really, really good in uh, their playoff games in the previous round. Um, Hammer Derby in both games, 7-zip on aggregate in the regular season. Like, come on. Aston Villa plus 120. I anticipate this to, by the time Monday rolls around, maybe to be closer to even money. Derby County head coach Frank Lampard, all of you soccer fans out there familiar with him, being linked heavily to the Chelsea job, that's going to be in the back of his mind here. And Villa's the bigger club, better players. Give me the plus 120 there. So why is that? Why? It doesn't make sense based on what you've laid out here. Hey, man, I don't set the lines. (laughs) I just think it's a... So the, the three-way money line market is just for 90 minutes. So there's still a chance that this game goes into extra oh, okay. time. Two more 30, uh, two 15-minute halves and then penalties. Maybe odds makers are expecting Derby to come out and play a bit more conservative and a bit of a cagey affair, try and play for a nil-nil. Bit of Katie by the door, huh? That's right. Yeah. Um, but I just think the talent level, it, it, there's a golf here and uh, – when you got Jack Grealish, Tammy, Tammy Abraham on your side, got to give it a go. Plus 120? Yes, please. Okay, I'll make that bet. Lock it in. Um, before we sign off here, want to get to a little F1. Uh, Monaco Grand Prix 
the quote-unquote crown jewel of the Formula One season. I say that in prestige only. Regularly, a a pretty boring race. Um, The street circuit there in Monaco does not cater to exciting racing, uh, overtakes, uh, all that kind of fun stuff that you see at a proper uh, racing circuit. Uh, you know what though what was was it the last one had the the really narrow streets or two races ago oh that might have been azerbaijan oh my i thought somebody was gonna die yeah there's a real hard left when you're going down the main strip um and you take a sharp left and i can't remember if it was it wasn't this season but it might have been last year or the year before several accidents yeah. at that at yeah. that uh at that turn because um, some of these guys don't care that there's no room to pass. You know they that. don't. Yeah, you you have to have that mindset as yeah. an F1 driver. If you see a, a, an inch of a gap to overtake, you take it. And when you see a sharp turn, you brake as late as you can mm. because you need to get that edge and speed and acceleration out of the turn or the corner. But uh, Chris and I talked a little bit about the Spanish Grand Prix. Uh, a couple weeks ago here on the podcast. And the way this season has gone in Formula One, if you haven't been paying attention, it's been all Mercedes. I mean, as it's been down the years, uh, Toto Wolff has done a phenomenal job with the Silver Arrows. And of course, they've got Lewis Hamilton, uh, who wins championships every year. But even Uh, more, it's even more this year. It's even more dominant this year. We're five races in, and Mercedes has gone one, two in all five races. I think Hamilton's got three wins. Valtteri Bottas, his teammate, has two. Uh, and then vice versa for P2 finishes there uh, throughout the season so far. Um, So we advised you folks at home to just take Mercedes until proven otherwise, and that came to fruition with uh, Hamilton winning in Spain, Botas finishing second there in Barcelona. Five and five for Merck, so I'm just going to bring up the odds here real quick to have a look and see where we're at. I think... When I checked yesterday, I think Hamilton was plus 120. Uh, so Hamilton minus 105 now. Uh, Botas plus 250. Now, it's it can be, I don't want to say irresponsible, but it can it might not be in your best interest to place a wager in Formula 1 ahead of both practice runs and qualifying. Qualifying especially as it shapes the grid on race day. But with Hamilton at minus 105, Valtteri Bottas at plus 250, just take a shot with one of these guys. And as we get closer to race day, and Chris and I have talked about it here on the pod before, you will see more betting options at your book. You will see stuff like, um, you know, both cars on a given team to finish top 10, which you can start finding more value on. And certainly makes race day a bit more exciting considering the way Mercedes has gone so far. Well, I'm looking here at Mercedes double podium finish at minus 150. And I don't normally like to play that much juice, but I probably would for that bet. Minus 150, absolutely. I mean, and it it, it can be first, second, or third. The way the Botas and Hamilton have been going, come on. Got to give that a shot. Now, got to be pointed out here, uh, Danny Rick, Daniel Ricciardo won here last year when he was a member of Red Bull on an inferior team this year since since uh, switching to Renault. He is plus 75,000. So if you expect Danny Rick to uh, pull a rabbit out of his hat, I doubt it, the way Renault's been going. But interesting odds there on the defending champ. Here's, the, here, here's one for you. Both cars to be classified at Renault. Yes, plus 110. No, minus 150. So that's how it's going over Okay, there. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it should also be noted that uh, Ricardo's former teammate, Max Verstappen, set a record lap here last season. And he's put together a pretty good season. I believe he's third in the driver's standings entering the weekend. So he's ahead of both Ferrari guys, including Sebastian Vettel. Uh, and Max is there at plus 375. Mm-hmm. But again, if, uh, if you haven't bet F1 before, pay attention to uh, practice runs. Pay attention to qualifying, obviously, um, with not a ton of overtaking possibilities in Monte Carlo. Maybe a good idea to wait to see who's sitting on the pole. Hopefully they get out to a good start and then just lead the pack the rest of the way. Also, before we sign off here, would like to 
send RIP condolences to former F1 legend and two-time Monaco Grand Prix legend Nicky Lauda, who passed away on Monday night. Big loss in the F1 community there, legendary driver. They made a movie about his life just a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. so if you have, I, I, is it called Rush? Can't remember. It's a mo- great movie, uh, Nicky Lauda and James Hunt, uh, a British driver, and they were very competitive um, in a season, I want to say 77. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Great movie there. I think it's directed by Ron Howard. There's a, a whole lot of movies about him, actually, now that I look at it. Is there? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was called Rush 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Great movie. Um, so, yeah, there's your uh, Formula One capping. Uh, you were telling me a story yesterday about a buddy of yours who went to Monte Carlo. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> you're talking about Monaco being a little bit boring. Uh, apparently, the casino at, at Monte Carlo, which is like the holy grail of casinos. Right. Eh. Yeah. Uh, eh, bit of a letdown. It's okay. He said he'd, he'd he'd rather Vegas any day. Yeah. He said it was kind of stuffy. I think he said the minimum bets everywhere were insane. Yeah. And, you know, it just didn't have kind of the, the entertainment aspect you expect from a casino, yeah. more like an old style poker room, yeah. which some people might be into. For sure. But if you take a trip to Europe, you don't want to go to some like library with tables. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's you know? right. So he didn't, he didn't love it. He, I've been uh, to Monaco yeah. before, but never set foot in the casino. Yeah, I, I mean, I've never been there either. I'm, I'm sure I'd go for the experience to say I was there. Totally. It would just be something to tick off the list. That's it. Yeah, but listen... I'm I'm a poor, poor audience for that because if there was a casino right there, yeah, I put money there. <laughs> yeah, you know if there's someone running a game out in the parking lot and it wasn't even if it was windy and I had to hold my cards down on the table, you'd sit down. Absolutely, love it. Middle of traffic, even. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, if you do not follow Chris Abbott on Twitter, what are you doing? Make sure you do so at Chris Oddshark. I am. At chalk underscore ninja. Make sure you watch Guys and Bets Monday to Friday at noon Eastern over on our YouTube channel. Chris and Joe do a great job of breaking down everything you need to know to get you sorted for the day ahead. And before you even do that, you need to watch Nick Costos, 9 a.m. Eastern on Periscope at Odd Shark on Twitter. Nick puts together about a 45 minute to an hour long show. Amazing stuff, amazing content, great rant. So start your day with Nick, finish it off with Guys and Bets, Chris and Joe, over on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate all our listeners out there, and we will check you next week.